Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Boldrini. This podcast is for everyone who wants to be part of our real estate family and learn commercial real estate investing from A to Z. I'll be sharing with you tips for real estate investing while being mentored by a few people with several years of experience so that you and I can make the least amount of mistakes as possible and succeed a lot faster. My goal is to keep things very straightforward because I value your time and you are here to learn. With that, in the last episode, we learned what are the really important things that you need to start doing as soon as you get in contract to purchase a property. And in this episode, we are learning what are some of the benefits of investing in commercial real estate in the United States We are learning how to become financially free with real estate and starting from scratch with no credit and also how to overcome paralysis analysis that can happen to a lot of people, especially in the beginning. We are interviewing Reed Goosens, the author of Investing in the U.S., The Ultimate Guide to U.S. Real Estate and 10,000 miles to the American dream. Here we go. Reed, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to have you here and uh, would love for you to start by sharing with us a little bit about you. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for having me on the show. A little bit about me, originally from Australia. My deep Southern accent came, moved out to the United States in 2012. I moved out here to pursue a career in structural engineering, actually, but quickly realized the barriers to entry into the real estate market were a lot lower compared to where I came from in Australia. And I started investing and seven years later, I achieved financial freedom. And now eight years later, I'm the founder of Wildhorn Capital and I'm a podcast host of Investing in the US and recently got a best-selling author. So a lot has happened and a lot in terms of the last eight years since moving to the United States, but I'm hopefully can share that journey with your listeners, but uh, also we can dive deep into commercial real estate investing. Why don't you tell us a little bit of what are the key differences between investing in Australia and the United States? Oh, no, do you have an hour? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, from a fundamental point of view, people have asked me, have you made money in Australia in real estate investing? And the answer is no. I've not actually ever invested in Australia. I picked up the book Rich Dad poured out in late 2009 started self-educating myself in Aussie, you know, doing some very basic stuff like fixing and flipping and lease options. I was going to pull the trigger, but then I moved to the United States. But since being here in the United States and doing business here and looking back at Australia, I now understand the differences. And really, it boils down to a couple of key factors, that is, Stephanie. The number one factor is population. Australia, from a landmass point of view, is the same size give or take as mainland America. So that's excluding Alaska. I'm not talking about Alaska involved or Hawaii. And we have about 24 million people. You compare that to America, where you have about 350 million people, I think, at last count. We in Australia can only inhabit about 18 or 20% of our land because the majority of the land is actually a desert. And so when you can only invest, buy in sort of coastal markets, coupled with that, where you, you have a very small population, compare that to America, where you can reside pretty much from east coast to west coast, from north to south. And the population is also meaning that you're driving these sort of secondary and tertiary markets, more affordable places to live. So when you can inhabit the entire country, you have a larger population, it means that there's going to be more pockets for affordability, right? People will try and seek out affordability compared to Australia, where everyone's sort of bottlenecked around the major cities. The second thing is also that the United States, out of all the Western countries in the world, because of the population and because of the capitalism and because of different way in which business is done here, it has a combination of both appreciation markets, but also cash flowing markets. In Australia, we're all really much just an appreciation type of game. So you have to understand that comes back to the population point of view. The third major issue with Australia, particularly when it comes to commercial real estate, is that because we only have 24 million people, our lending arms, the lending facilities that we have in Australia, are not as great as what they are here in America, meaning that We can't find in Australia commercial A-grade debt like you can find here, Freddie and Fannie, that is interest only for seven or 10 years and amortized over 30 years. 
in Australia, you can really only find stuff that's maybe interest only for two years that might really only last a seven-year term. And non-recourse is very difficult to come by in Australia. And that's just purely because, one, the lack of population, two, the lack of different financing arms in order to finance the country. Unlike America, where we have four major banks in Australia, you probably have maybe a dozen lending arms in Australia in terms of on the commercial side. Here in the States, you probably have thousands of different ways of getting commercial financing for your property. So couple all that together, and I'm going to throw in another wrinkle, is that multifamily commercial real estate does not exist in Australia. And it doesn't exist because the banks don't view it as a business, right? Also, banks will only get involved with the construction of new multifamily if you pre-sell X amount of space, X amount of units off the plan, which is a condominium. So all these factors, population, land mass, lending criteria and lending arms that are available to commercial real estate and the way in which you know they view particularly multifamily real estate. I'm just getting started on the different ways to compare the United States versus Australia. So when people talk about commercial lending in America and the investment landscape, there is just such an opportunity that most Americans don't realize that when you compare it to other countries, particularly Western countries, there's just so much more opportunity here than there are in Australia where I'm from. Would it be fair to say that commercial buildings are mainly owned by a handful of people, to put it simply? To put it simply, yeah. So the easiest way to compare it to is think of LA, New York, San Francisco. That's Australia. You've got very high demand capital cities to where people want to live, low cap rates. So I don't know who specifically owns the big buildings. I don't know who specifically owns the big building. The Rockefeller Center obviously was owned by Rockefeller back in the day, but I don't know who owns it now. But high demand, low supply, low cap rates. That's exactly the same environment as it is in Australia when it comes to office buildings, hotels, commercial assets. So when you compare it like that, it's think of the LA, San Francisco market all over the entire country because again, population. So I hope that answers the question. Definitely. So you moved to the US and then within seven years, you were financially free. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about that. Were you working during those seven years full time while investing in real estate? How did that come about? Yes. Yes. So the first forte into the real estate market, educating myself prior to moving here. And the reason I moved to the United States was the love, two two loves, Uh, one love of New York City and the love of my wife, or my then girlfriend, now my wife, who was American. So I moved to the United States as a structural engineer. That's what I went to school for. That's what I did for my better part of a decade. And I got a job in New York City. And then really within the first two weeks, I think in the first month of being fresh off the boat, I was at my first RIA event, the Real Estate Investment Associations, and quickly realizing that the barriers to entry here in the American market are so much lower. Now, obviously not in New York City, but In other outlying secondary and tertiary markets, like I saw Syracuse, New York, it was a four-hour drive from New York City. And I started looking in those types of markets because, Stephanie, I couldn't borrow when I first moved here because I didn't even know what a credit score was because I didn't even have any credit. So my first forte into the real estate game was actually buying a a triplex for 38,000 bucks. And it was just because I could choose a market that was affordable and was within driving distance of New York City. I could get started in the market. So really, that was where, how I got started. I was self-educating myself for about two and a half years, going to the rear events, two and a half years meaning prior to coming to America. And then when I came in 2012, fresh off the boat, started learning from the American lingo and the American commercial real estate investment ways. And then within, I think, six months or seven months of being in the country, I'd had my first deal because those couple of years prior to that was just all self-educating. And I got to the point where I was getting analysis paralysis and I needed to stop reading about doing deals and actually go out and do them. And America allowed me the opportunity to do that because the barriers to entry into the market was so much lower compared to where I'm from. And so without a credit score, how did you buy that first property? All cash, all All cash. cash. (laughs) Yeah. And what I did was to build credit, uh, for those people who don't know how to build credit, if you zero, come from you know another country, I had to put down a thousand dollars on a credit card and just start spending that money. I also showed the local bank that I was depositing rental checks and that I did use my own money. And so when the local bank realized that I was using these rental checks were coming in and I'd bought this money all cash, they then gave me a line of credit for about twenty five, twenty eight thousand dollars over six months. So I was able to prove that, and then they gave me this line of credit and I was able to go buy a deal number two. 
And so from that, I was slowly building credit over a period of time, my worthiness to be lent to, to, for borrowers to lend to me. And that's how I just slowly but surely got the credit going, got the credit ticking away. Let's talk about the paralysis analysis. What would you recommend people doing? How much do you recommend people learning in order to get over that Look, and buy their first uh, property? Yeah, analysis paralysis is needed. And I think I'd rather be at analysis paralysis stage than not doing anything. i oh, sorry, than jumping in too soon. So you always have to start with education. Education, education, education. And even today, I own 1,800 units in multifamily. I'm still learning stuff and I'll continue to learn stuff. And so it's really important to, if you are getting into this game, to understand how to underwrite deals because that is the most important thing. If you don't know what a deal looks like, you won't know how to act. You don't know how to go get it under contract. So understanding the numbers behind it, particularly in commercial, is really, really important. So understanding how the income is generated, how revenue is generated from a property, whether it be from a multifamily or a hotel or a warehouse or a self-storage, whatever it might be, you need to understand how the top line is created and how do you increase that top line. The second thing you need to understand is what expenses to each individual assets in the commercial quote-unquote sector, what do they have? Multifamily has different expenses to a hotel and the hotel has different expenses to a self-storage facility. So you need to understand line by line what those expenses are and you need to understand how to read a P&L, a profit and loss statement. Once you know how to read a profit and loss statement and once you understand how to generate revenue and reduce expenses or maintain expenses at a reasonable rate, that's how you learn how to increase the net operating income and thus the cash flow and thus the overall value of the asset. So if you don't know how to do that, then you need to start there. If you do know how to do that and you're trying to get out of your own way for analysis paralysis, you have to surround yourself with people who are doing it. Because analysis paralysis just means that you are too scared, you haven't seen or experienced enough things or people around you to order to be confident to go do it. So you know when you go, if you've ever been you know, jumping off a diving platform at a pool, and it might be a 10-meter diving platform, and it's fun, it's scary, but your mate does it first. And then you're like, oh, well, he did it, I can do it. It's the same thing with analysis paralysis. If you're not surrounding yourself with people who are actually doing commercial real estate deals, then you're not going to have the confidence to go out and do them yourself. What it does mean is if you are surrounding yourself with people who are doing commercial real estate deals, or maybe you can learn from them. Maybe they can be a mentor of yours to give you credibility, to give you the confidence to go out and be an operator. The analysis paralysis can be overcome by understanding your numbers, understanding how to find deals, and surrounding yourself with the right people in order to be successful in order to use their credibility or in order to ride on their coattails towards helping you become a successful operator, if that's what you so want to be. How did you go about finding your business partner? How do I go about finding? A little bit of luck, (laughs) but I've had business partners in the past that haven't worked out. And what you have to, two things you've got to really be cognitive of is understanding first and foremost, what your skill set is. And for me, I was working full-time as a, with this developer in LA, but I was also wanting to do deals on the side and I was co-syndicating deals with my mentor. Uh, this is back in 2014, 2015, but I wanted to st- stop playing second fiddle to my mentor and I wanted to go out and be my own operator. So I started looking at 50 to 100 unit deals in Dallas. Now I live in Los Angeles, but I needed to build out my mousetrap. And so what I did was I went and hired a couple of analysts because what I was realizing was that I was working full-time, I was having my life, my relationships. So I was having, you know, trying to be, enjoy my life, go to the beach and all that sort of stuff, but also build the business and keep moving it forward. And I realized that I was being the bottleneck in my business. And so I went out and started developing my systems in and around underwriting deals. And I hired people at 15, 20 bucks an hour to underwrite more deals because they could underwrite more deals. That means I could see more deals and I could then offer on more deals. But what Mm -hmm. I was missing was, and I was offering all these deals and I was getting to best and final, I was getting to seller calls. But I wasn't, I didn't have that one piece which was missing from my tool set was the boots on the ground, the credibility with the brokers. And I was missing out on these deals by thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, which is not a lot of money when it's a couple of million dollar deal because I didn't have that broker relationship. And that is where my business partner had a skill set that I didn't have. And he was boots on the ground. And he was not into the weeds like I was into the weeds. And he wasn't into building systems like I was building systems, but he had something valuable that he could bring to the table. And we had complementary skill sets. 
So the most important thing when you're finding a business partner is that you want to have complementary skill sets. You don't want to be doing the same tasks twice, right? And the understanding is that this business and any business, it takes a team to do it, right? You can't do it all by yourself. And if you think you can, you're hugely mistaken because you're going to burn yourself out too quickly trying to wear all the hats and that's not how to be effective. So back to the question of how we met, we met through, I've been quote unquote dating a lot of people and it was really by chance someone had introduced us to one another. Probably it's a little bit older than me. He's about five, six years older than me. He was, had that young hustle type of mindset being in his mid to late thirties. Again, he had something to bring to the table that I didn't have and I had something to bring to the table that he didn't have. So it was very much a mutual respect for one another instantly. Over time, we developed more of a, that respect, making sure our values aligned, making sure we understood where the direction of the business is going and understanding what our North Star is. And really, our North Star for both of us is living a life by design, living a life on our terms. And so if we both agree to that, then we know how to direct the ship in the way that we want to go and we can go off and conquer more. And the way I kind of look at it is that Andrew, my business partner, he goes and shakes the lemon tree and I determine if we make lemonade or lemon juice out of it. So that's probably the best analogy I can give. (laughs) Love it. Is there anything else that our audience should know or any tips that you would like to share with them that you learned along the way? Oh, sure. Look, the big thing with all of this is that people want to do it to become financially free. They want to get into the business to leave their day job. What I say to people is that run your own bloody race. Don't look at other people. Look at your own situation. Look at how you can continue to move the needle and enjoy the journey. Because Ultimately, life is short and that you will get to where you're going with the right mindset. It may take some time, but if you have the wrong mindset on the front end and think you're going to be financially free within two years, you might be able to achieve that. Well done. But the majority of us can't achieve that. It might take five, six, 10 years, a decade. And I'm an example of that. I moved to this country with limited funds, no established network, and started learning again, essentially from scratch. And I was able to achieve financial freedom in seven years. Now, seven years is still a long time. But what I'm saying is that if you go into this thinking you're going to achieve it in two years and you get to the end of two years and you haven't achieved it, you'll have a higher likelihood of quitting and not sticking to the game than you will if you thought, well, I'm going to go in this it may take seven to 10 years. If you have that mindset on the front end, you're going to enjoy the journey a little bit more. You're going to be able to give yourself credit for when credit is due when you're slowly putting that the one foot in front of the other. And over time, if you're consistent with what you do, you will see results. So consistency, mindset, and never giving up is really, really important. And I second that very much, especially that first year can be a bit (laughs) challenging. When I say don't compare yourself to other people, if you need a day job to keep the bills paid and keep the roof over your head, then keep it. (laughs) You know, it's what Mm -hmm. you got to do. Do whatever you need to do in your life in order to keep you happy and keep the wolves at bay. And if that means you need to be in the W-2 job for another three or four years and you have to work harder on the weekends, so be it. But it's okay that you don't, you don't have to compare yourself to anyone else because, oh, I didn't achieve financial freedom for five or six years. Who cares? I was hustling at this whole thing since from when I first moved here in 2012 to 2000, late 2017 before I was able to quit my day job. And it was a lot of hard work and it was a lot of sleepless nights and long weekends. But I got there in the end because I knew I could back myself. And that's probably one other lesson is learn to back yourself, learn to bet on yourself. If you can't bet on yourself, then who can you bet on? And that's really, really important to understand as well. And five years in the grand scheme of things is, is really nothing. I remember but- someone saying to me, uh, <laughs> Stephanie, is does it matter if you have achieved financial freedom? If you're 70 or 80 years of age with your grandkids and does it matter if you're telling them stories of when you achieved a financial freedom? Does it matter if it was 2017 or 2021 <laughs> or 2025? And the answer is it doesn't yeah. freaking matter. Yeah. It matters that you are their granddad and you're there to watch them grow up. So we're all wanting it to happen tomorrow. And that's great. And it, having drive is really important because it got me here, but also making sure that you don't neglect other areas in your life, uh, I think is the message I'm trying to relay here. <laughs> that's wonderful. A lot of lessons on mindset. Thank Mm, you, Reed. My pleasure. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Best way is just go to my website at reedgoosens.com. That's R-E-E-D-G-O-O-S-S-E-N-S.com. You can check out my podcast, which is called Investing in the US. You can check out, I've got two books up on Amazon and I've got a new audio book from the first book 
which is now should hopefully be coming up on audible.com here in the next couple of weeks. I, mean, I live in LA and if you're ever coming through LA and you want to say g'day, just shoot me an email at info, I-N-F-O at readgoosens.com. Just make sure you give me a month's notice because I'm also very busy running a real estate company, um, but I'm always willing to meet up and talk shop and go for a beer if people are interested. Awesome. Reed, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Had an awesome time and Steffi doing a great job. So thank you very much. Do you know anyone who is interested in learning about commercial real estate investing? Make sure to share this podcast with them. And if you are learning from this podcast, I would greatly appreciate a review on the podcast app. And I will see you next time.